Uh, my name is Lenore Chen. I'm a local artist, uh, born and raised in San Francisco, and I'm involved with the film that's about to screen at the De Young Museum called The Worlds of Bernice Bing. And um, I got involved in this project because of my relationship with the Bernice Bing estate and uh, many of the friends who are involved in the film project as interviewees or the filmmaker are all tied in together. Um, I got involved with some of the early archival work after uh, Bing, uh, otherwise known as Bingo, died. She died in 1998 and there was a core group of us who have been involved with uh, projects uh, designed to uh, establish her legacy as an artist um, in uh, the Bay Area and nationally. Uh, she was very well known in her early days, I would say the late 50s, early 60s, because she had graduated from the California School of Fine Arts and was part of a lot of programs that uh, got its start in the Bay Area very, very early on. So we want to tell her story. The uh, documentary, it's a 34-minute film. Um, it covers uh, some of her history as a child. Uh, she lost her parents at an early age and she ended up going through quite a few foster homes. She spent some time in the Ming Huang um, orphanage uh, for uh, young children. I think they were uh, mostly little girls. And uh, it follows that through her development as an artist. She got a scholarship to go to the, um, uh, I believe it's the California School of Fine Arts. She, she also went for a brief time to uh, what was then known as uh, uh, California, what was it? Uh, it was the uh, CCAC it was referred to. Now they, they shorten the title to uh, uh, California College of the Arts. That was brief. And then she went to the Art Institute, which still uh, exists over on um, Chestnut Street. Um, and, uh, and, it, and then it goes through her early development as a professional artist. She lived in a number of places uh, in San Francisco and um, uh, largely in the North Beach Chinatown area. Her family at one time had a a residence there, but uh, she also lived in the Sunset District for a time, um, a couple of years, uh, toward the end of her uh, term as the first executive director of the South of Market Cultural Center, which is now known as SOMARTS. Um, that still exists, and um, uh, she was uh, part of the founding of that uh, uh, institution. Uh, and uh, you know, I would say that sometime around the early 80s, uh, I understand from um, uh, Alexa Young, who is the executive director of uh, the Being the State, uh, she lived in the Sunset for a couple of years. Uh, she moved into a storefront uh, in March of 1982, um, and it was uh, primarily a transitional period for her. She was sort of trying to wind down as the uh, administrator at the uh, South Market Cultural Center because it really took away from her time creating her own art. So uh, she found this storefront um, and it served as both her studio space to get back into her own art making and uh, she lived there. Uh, apparently the, the front part, which was a storefront, was where she uh, did her art and she also uh, kept it up as a, a little alternative um, what you would call today a pop-up gallery uh, and a number of her friends uh, most notably I think Leo Valador who was a, a Bay Area painter uh, showed there with her uh, they created works on paper and exhibited there and uh, her own living quarters was in the back and then behind that there was a garden. So I understand that was on the first floor. Um, and I think if you go to the uh, area now or Google it, um, it's a little Chinese grocery store. Uh, and that's, that was like 30 years ago that she lived there, something like that. And, um, and during that time, she was trying to figure out where she wanted to go next, uh, how she was going to transition out of the uh, hectic and chaotic uh, 
life of uh, trying to run an arts uh, cultural center and, and get back to her own work. So during that time is when she made plans to go to China for a few months. And she uh, left the Bay Area and went to China in 1984, um, and where she studied calligraphy. I think she might have taught a little art while she was over there. Um, and then when she came back to the Bay Area, that's when she decided that uh, she was going to go find a place in the country to live. She, she had been kind of going back and forth there for a period of time. She worked up in the Maya Camas, uh vineyards. And when she came home to San Francisco, she started making plans to um, move up to the Anderson Valley. And she chose Philo, uh, a little rural uh, town up that way. Um, I think it's on the edge of Mendocino County. And there she stayed uh, uh, for the rest of her life. We met her in the last eight to ten years of her life. And the main area where we would uh, uh, gather is through the Asian American Women Artists Association, which is uh, uh, producing this film. Uh, she was living in Philo by that time, and, but she would make the like three hour ride down windy roads to get to the city to to come to our meetings and I would see her around town at cultural events but where I really got to know her was when we were involved in um, exhibits and things relating to the uh, AWA as we call it and so that's how I kind of got to know her. I was uh, an exhibiting artist and we would also go to each other's art exhibits um, one of the ones that I attended with her, which uh, there's a little color, an old color uh, Polaroid snapshot shows me with a, her and a couple of other friends uh, in one of her last uh, little shows uh, sponsored by a group called Gallery on the Rim. Um, in her later years, she would, you know, uh, periodically get into group shows and things. Um, and, and so uh, those of us who were able to go to those things would, you know, uh, gather for those kinds of events and celebrate our exhibits. Well, one time we went to uh, Mills College to hear uh, uh, a panel discussion. Uh, there was a selection of uh, a variety of visual artists, Asian American women. Uh, I think Moira Roth, who is the pro uh, professor of art at Mills College and still is there, um, uh, organized a, an event and uh, Bingo and I were sitting up in the you know top part of the uh, uh, auditorium listening and uh, there was a young um, I think she is a Vietnamese uh, uh, mixed media installation artist was uh, and also a lesbian she was uh, presenting some of her work which we uh, some of the uh, younger uh, members of the audience found a, a, for them a little outrageous um, and uh, I remember Bingo and I, you know, just sort of let out a laughter because, uh, it, it, you know, I think we were the only ones that kind of understood um, Hunty Fom's work. And uh, and uh, when when uh, we laughed and, and Bingo let out a, a loud guffaw, I think it, she was a little embarrassed because she realized, oh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of in an academic environment. You know, she kind of lived a uh, fragmented life. Uh, her lesbian friends were, you know, one circle of friends and, and other art friends were in another area. And then the people that she moved in with the, in the academic world were, you know, were, they were all kind of separate. So she kind of, she kind of kept uh, certain aspects of her life very private. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and those of us who kind of moved in similar circles with her were aware of these different worlds that we, that she moved in which is part of uh, what's going to be unveiled in the documentary film. When I first uh, saw her, a lot of times it might have been at a, uh, a cultural event that was uh, hosted by lesbian artists. Um, I was involved with uh, a group called uh, Lesbian Visual Artists. It no longer exists, but uh, through that group, we also had mutual friends, and I would uh, sometimes I would see her at these events, or I saw her give a talk. She was not out as a lesbian uh, in those days, um, and and so I would see her in that context, and then I would see her uh, in. Uh, 
uh, uh, art contexts where you know her her sexual orientation was not known. Um, so they didn't really intersect publicly. She was very uh, private about that, and I think that was partly due to her generation uh, and perhaps uh, her her you know. Um, uh, upbringing in terms of uh, keeping her art separated from, you know, her personal life, uh, that kind of thing. So, you know, I think for her, I think she found it kind of tricky to navigate. So certain aspects she would be kind of quiet about, and others, you know, uh, she would be more public. And it was her art that was more public, that she was willing to talk about her art. Uh, but in her day, uh, she didn't necessarily even identify as a, an Asian American artist. Today it might be a little different. So she was kind of bracketed, I think, by uh, different kinds of uh, mores or uh, cultural expectations.